Oh, I, I brought my stuff and I very well can. Well,
today. Especially glad that you're here. We look forward to uh, sharing this time of worship together. I invite you to register your attendance on the connection cards that are included in your order of service, and we will uh, collect those during the offering time. There are a number of announcements that are highlighted in the inserts, a couple that I want to lift up. First of all, um, the Labor for Your Neighbor sign-ups continue today, and you can uh, sign up in the patio. Another opportunity that I want to lift up um, at this time as well, this is uh, going on the same time as Labor for Your Neighbor, and that is the uh, Back to School Backpack Drive that's sponsored by the Voyager Fellowship Group. This group has this year doubled its commitment to um, to pulling together backpacks, and it's double because they've added a school, and they're going to now collect backpacks, backpacks for Gage uh, Elementary School here in our neighborhood. So they're going from 50 to 100. So um, I encourage your generosity and support of this program. You can, uh, there's a good article in your insert about this, they'll give you all the information you need to either donate cash or material so that uh, they're able to meet their goal in time for school to start. Greg, would you uh, speak yeah. to this for a minute? I just wanted to take a moment to express my deep and heartfelt thanks and gratitude for your prayers and support in this past week after my father's passing back in Illinois. We had a marvelous celebration of his life and we celebrated his 92 years but having your support and the cards that you sent meant a great deal to me, and I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Let's stand and greet one another. Good morning.
ever, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. The first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end.
gospel lesson is from the 13th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, verses 1 through 9, and then 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what's sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, and indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, and another sixty, and in another thirty. That is the gospel reading. Our hymn is uh, Bring Forth the Kingdom. This is a call and response hymn. And so uh, Pat is going to stand and lead us, right? And you will all stand and we will follow your directions.
Well, the parable we just read begins a series of stories in the 13th chapter of Matthew that are called the parables of the kingdom. Though they may seem similar in theme, each parable presents a different image of what the kingdom of heaven is like. So as this chapter begins, we find Jesus staying in a beach house with his disciples. And he leaves the intimacy of that gathering of 12 and goes outside to meet a steadily growing crowd of people. And as the crowd expands, Jesus decides that he can probably address them best by sitting slightly offshore in a rowboat on the lake. So from his shaky perch then, he delivers an allegorical concert of metaphors that describe the mysteries of heaven. He tells them the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, or a pearl of great price, or like a buried treasure in a field, or like a net that's thrown into the ocean. And all of these metaphors offer little glimpses of what it's like in the kingdom of heaven. Now I imagine for the crowd gathered on the beach that day, this time with Jesus felt more like a poetry reading than a lecture. Given that, we can assume that not everybody was going to hear the same thing of what Jesus said. For some, these parables seem so simplistic that even a child could make sense of them. For others, the stories triggered for them the most wonderful sense of clarity and wonder about who God is in the world. So I think we can also assume in the reading of these parables that Jesus had a pretty good read on his audience. He knew that some were there out of curiosity, some were there seeking healing, and presumably there were also detractors there who were suspicious of Jesus, and they were there to gather evidence against him. But regardless of the motives of this diverse audience, Jesus takes a seat on the bench of a boat in the position of a teacher, and he tells some stories about farming. And the experience of the crowd actually mirrors the point of the story, because some get it and some don't. For what one hears from the parable depends, in large part, on where one's heart is. Well, the whole passage that we read this morning is, is really two different sermons. The first one is called the parable of the sower, and it's told by Jesus. In fact, it's a special parable because it is among the very small number of passages that biblical scholars feel may really have been words that came out of Jesus' mouth. This parable, this little bit of that passage we read today, shows up in all three of the Gospels, and that alone attests to its authenticity and heightens the likelihood that these were really true words of Jesus. The second part of the passage is a teaching, then, about the first part. And Matthew, or someone Matthew knew, interpreted that parable as an allegory that addressed a problem that was prevalent in the Jewish Christian congregation at that time. And the pressing question was, in that congregation, was, if Jesus is the Messiah, then why hasn't everybody converted? So the second sermon, which takes up verses 18 to 23, is the answer that Matthew gives to this lingering question. So he says to them, each type of soil represents a certain type of person. The first group is like hard, dried up soil, really more like a hard packed trail than a patch of soil. A person like this doesn't absorb or retain anything. There are people for whom the word of God goes in one ear and out the other. The second group hears a little differently. They are more like rocky soil that may trap a seed in its crevices, but the seed never germinates. It sits there until the weather gets rough, and then it washes away. Rocky soil believers may get excited or scared occasionally, but after the thrill or the fear is gone, their faith dissipates as well. The third group hears the word of God, but it, it doesn't change them much. They're like thorny soil that has a way of crowding out the sea with so many other distractions. So the, their faith just really isn't even given the room it needs to grow. The fourth kind of believer is one who understands what he or she hears, 
and then responds to it faithfully. They are like fertile, rich soil that receives the seed and then thrives. So Matthew's sermon invites us to dig up a little dirt about ourselves as we apply the allegory to our own lives and ask, what kind of soil am I for the word of God? How good is my hearing? How does my faith life measure up to my other list of life priorities? Am I really the best soil that I can be? Well, this sermon that Matthew gives to his congregation is not a bad sermon, but I'm not really sure that it is what Jesus was talking about when he told that story from the boat. I don't think he was really talking about the seeds at all. He was teaching about the sower. It's called the parable of the sower, actually. And this little sermon that I just talked about of Matthew's, if it had a title, it would probably be the parable of the dirt. For Jesus and Matthew are actually preaching very different sermons in this one passage. Well, the intention of Jesus' parable is to tell people about who God is and to offer glimpses of what the kingdom of heaven will be like. So let's listen then again to the first sermon, to Jesus' sermon about the extravagant and the mysterious love of God. In the kingdom of heaven, God is a generous farmer, one who throws seeds everywhere. Every hour of every day, God casts them with just joyous abandon. And some seeds land in ditches and some in patches of weeds. Lots of them get picked up by birds on the dry ground. And the results of this haphazard casting appears to be no problem for the farmer, for he or she is neither cautious nor concerned about where any of these seeds go. God just throws them out there, not to waste it, but rather to see what might happen. Now the gardeners among us might frown upon the methods of this farmer and think, I can't afford to garden that way. It's too wasteful and careless. We would likely spend our time on the good soil alone. We'd carefully map out our gardens in places they get the best sun, and then we would plant the seeds methodically, counting them out and pushing them just the right distance in their rightful place. But not God, the farmer. The farmer loves to cast seeds all over the land, indiscriminately and mercifully. Now farming this way is God's privilege, and luckily for the world, it's God's habit. For in casting seeds all over the ground, God never ceases to fill the world with fresh hope for new life. Now for the early church, this parable must have come as great encouragement because they were living out their faith in adverse conditions. They were called to be the church for the first time in a culture that was not interested in listening to what they had to say. And not only were they deaf to this new thing that they were talking about, but they were pretty violently opposed to it. So the early Christians needed to hear the good news that failure is part of doing something new, that not all their efforts are going to bear fruit. That doesn't mean that they should quit trying, but rather by the grace and the persistence of the Holy Spirit, the church was able to gain hope from this parable. But doesn't the church today know the truth of this parable as well? How many times have we tried new ideas or programs or ministries in hopes that they will reach new people in relevant ways? We try to open our doors wider to the community based on careful readings of demographic studies and surveys. We keep trying to spread the word, but sometimes it's like there's no one listening. Some of our best ideas get really lousy responses. So we need to remember that in the parable, only one in four seeds took root. Does that mean, therefore, that we should be more careful next time? Not according to this parable. God, the farmer, just throws out more seed more often over a broader area. God throws it out in spring and in winter. And the message here is not to be more cautious, 
The message is to throw out more seed and just see what happens. So the promise of this parable is that God's harvest happens in God's time. Keep on casting seeds. Keep on showing compassion and living faithfully. Don't stop taking risks for love because we don't know where the soil is fertile and ready for planting. Well, look then how this parable ends. What, what good soil there was ended up being really, really good. It was like miracle grow soil. It says grain came forth 30, 60, even 100 fold. Well, a seven fold yield would be a great result for a farmer. That would constitute a wonderful year, a bumper crop. But it says here it was a hundred fold. I mean, that's not normal. That's not business as usual farming. This is abundance and generosity and blessing. For when God casts the seed, a miracle can happen. Some years ago, Bill Moyers produced a documentary film on the hymn Amazing Grace. It was a wonderful program that showed the power of one song of love to plant seeds of hope in the most unexpected places. The last segment of this documentary was filmed at Wembley Stadium in London. The event was an all-day benefit concert celebrating the dramatic changes that had occurred in South Africa. Most of the performers were popular rock and rollers, like the group Guns N' Roses. Well, surprisingly, though, the promoters of the benefit scheduled the opera singer, Jesse Norman, to sing Amazing Grace as the closing act. The film cuts back and forth between scenes of the massive, unruly crowd in the stadium to Jesse Norman, who is waiting with Bill Moyers in her dressing room. The crowd just keeps yelling for more encores and the groups of wine while Jesse Norman waits until the time comes for her to take the stage. And finally, despite the screaming and the disorderliness of the crowd, she's called to sing. And Jesse Norman, dressed in African garb, walks out alone. No backup band, just a single spotlight leading her out onto the stage. The crowd is loud and restless. A voice yelled out for more Guns N' Roses. Other people began to chant. And the documentary camera then panned the whole crowd. But all alone, a cappella. Jesse Norman begins to sing very slowly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. And a remarkable thing happened in Wembley Stadium that night. For as she sang, 70,000 people became silent. And by the time she began the second verse, she had the crowd in her hands. And with the third verse, tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will bring me home. Thousands of people were singing with her. And after the concert, Bill Moyers asked her, what happened out there? And she confessed that she didn't know. But whatever happened, she planted a seed of amazing grace in a field of 70,000 people. And that night, they listened. Let us then stand and affirm our belief together. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives and calls us to join in his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised again by God, and reigns over all creation. And he bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing of the world. We are moved by the Holy Spirit, together with the communion of saints, as members of the body of Christ, God's holy and universal church. 
we are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of resurrection, and the reality of eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to follow Christ. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, let God's glory. Amen. Please be seated. We move again to a time of prayer together, and as we do, I invite you to come and light a prayer that would symbolize, or light a candle that would symbolize your prayer. Corporately and bring forth 
fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We are thankful for all the things bright and new and for your love. May we be fertile ground for that love. And to that end, gracious God, we gather our voices as one in the prayer that Jesus gave us, saying, My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us imitate then God's example of extravagant giving as the ushers come to receive our morning tithes and offerings, please.
seated then so that you might enjoy the uh, postlude from the, the woodland trio. The Lord bless you and keep you and go with you this day and always in peace.
Yes. Three, four, six, eight. Three, four, 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 six, eight. Yeah.
say hello. I
group has for many years provided backpacks for Jefferson Elementary School. They've done 50 backpacks a year. This year they've added to that commitment 50 backpacks from Gage Elementary School right here in our neighborhood. So there are many ways you can help out. The details for that are listed in uh, one of the inserts in your order of worship. But I hope that you will uh, find a way to take part in that project as well. Fred, would you uh, like to speak with us? I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for your care, your thoughts, your prayers, and your cards during my father's passing the past uh, two weeks. He had a rich and long 92 years, and he is at home now, and we are thankful for his life, but I deeply appreciate you as a community and as a family of support, and I want to thank you for, uh, and for my family for your cards and thoughts and prayers. Thank you very much. Uh, let's stand and greet one another.
If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. And at this time, I'm going to invite the children to come forward for just a few minutes. Psalm 119. 
short enough, they confirmed it, to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a stand for me, but I do not strike from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end.
gospel lesson is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 1 through 9, and then 18 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. That ends the gospel reading. Our hymn uh, is Bring Forth the Kingdom. It's in uh, Faith We Sing, number 2190. I invite you to stand, and this is a uh, hymn with a call and response. And so uh, Pat McLean will come and be our leader, and you follow uh, on the screen.
The parable that we just read begins a series of stories in the 13th chapter of Matthew that are called the parables of the kingdom. Though they may seem similar in theme, each parable presents a different image of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And as the chapter begins, we find Jesus staying at a beach house with his disciples. And he leaves the intimacy of that gathering of 12 and he goes outside to meet the steadily growing crowd of people. And as that crowd continues to expand, Jesus decides that he can dress them best, address them best by sitting slightly offshore in a rowboat on the lake. And so then from this shaky perch, he delivers an allegorical concert of metaphors that describe the mysteries of heaven. He tells them that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, or a pearl of great price, or like a buried treasure in a field, or like a net that's thrown out into the ocean. All of these metaphors offer little glimpses of what it's like in God's kingdom. And I imagine for the crowd gathered on the beach that day, this time with Jesus felt more like a poetry reading than a lecture. Given that, we can assume that not everybody there was going to hear the same thing in what Jesus said. And for some of them, these parables seem so simplistic that even a child could understand. For others, the stories triggered the most wonderful sense of clarity and wonder about who God is in their world. And I think we can also assume that in reading these parables that Jesus had a pretty good read on his audience. He knew that some were there out of curiosity, some had come that day for healing, and presumably there were also detractors there who were suspicious of Jesus and were there to gather evidence against him. But regardless of the motives of this diverse audience, Jesus takes a seat on the bench of the boat in the position of a teacher, and he tells some stories about farming. And the experience of the crowd actually mirrors the point of the story. Some get it, and some don't. For what one hears from the parable depends in large part on where one's heart is. Now the whole passage that we read this morning is really two different sermons. The first one, called the parable of the sower, is told by Jesus. In fact, this is a really special parable in that it is among the small number of passages that biblical scholars feel may really have come out of Jesus' mouth. This parable shows up in three of the Gospels, and, and that alone attests to its authenticity and heightens the likelihood that these were true words of Jesus. The second part of the passage is a teaching or a sermon about the first part. And Matthew, or someone Matthew knew, interpreted the story as an allegory that addresses a problem that was prevalent in that Jewish Christian congregation at the time. And the pressing question was likely, if Jesus is the Messiah, then why hasn't everyone converted? So the second sermon, which takes place in verses 18 to 23, is the answer that Matthew gives to this lingering question. He says to them, each type of soil represents a certain kind of person. The first group is like hard, dried up soil, really more like a hard packed trail than anything else. They don't absorb or retain anything. These are the kinds of people for whom the word of God goes in one ear and out the other. The second group hears a little differently. They are more like rocky soil that may trap the seed in its crevices, but the seed never germinates. It just sits there until the weather gets rough and, and then it washes away. Rocky soil believers may get excited or scared occasionally, but then after the thrill or the fear is gone, their faith dissipates as well. The third group hears the word of God, but it doesn't change them much. They're a lot like that sorry soil that has a way of crowding out all the seeds with a lot of other distractions. Their faith really is never given enough room to grow. The fourth kind of believer is one who understands what he or she hears, 
and then responds faithfully. They're like fertile, rich soil that receives the seed and then thrives. So Matthew's sermon, the second part of this passage, invites us to dig up some dirt about ourselves as we apply this allegory to our own lives and ask, what kind of soil am I for the Word of God? How good is my hearing? How does my faith life measure up in terms of my other list of priorities? Am I really the best soil that I can be? Well, this sermon that Matthew gives to his congregation is not a bad sermon, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's what Jesus was talking about when he was telling stories from the boat. I don't think that he was really talking about the seeds. Jesus was talking about the sower. It's actually, as you know, called the parable of the sower. If the little sermon that I just talked about in Matthew's had a title, it would be more like the parable of the dirt. Jesus and Matthew are actually preaching on different topics here. Now the intention of Jesus' parable is to tell people about who God is and to offer glimpses of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. So let's listen into the first sermon, to Jesus' sermon, about the extravagant and mysterious love of God. Now, in the kingdom of heaven, God is a generous farmer, one who casts seeds everywhere. Every hour of every day, God throws them with joyous abandon. And some of those seeds land in ditches and some in patches of weeds. Lots of them get picked up by birds on the dry ground. But the result of this haphazard casting is really no problem for the farmer, for he or she is neither cautious nor concerned about where those seeds go. God just throws them out there, not to waste it, but rather to see what might grow. Now the gardeners among us might frown upon the methods of this farmer and think, I can't afford a garden that way. It's too wasteful, and careless. We'd likely spend our time on good soil alone, and we would carefully map out our gardens in the places that get the best sun. <clears throat> then we, when we wanted to plant seeds, we'd put them in just the right place and measure them the right distance and stick our finger in just the right amount into the soil. But not God the farmer. This farmer loves to cast seeds all over the land, indiscriminately and mercifully. Farming this way is God's privilege, and luckily for the world, it's also God's habit. For in casting seeds all over the ground, God never ceases to fill the world with fresh hope for new life. Now for the early church, this parable must have come as great encouragement because they were living out their faith in adverse conditions. They were called to be the church for the first time in a culture that really was not interested in listening to what they had to say. So not only were they falling on deaf ears, but the people were also violently opposed in many cases to what they were saying. So the early Christians needed to hear the good news that failure is part of doing something new. Not all of their efforts are going to bear fruit. But that doesn't mean that they should quit trying. For by the grace and the persistence of the Holy Spirit, the early church gained hope from this story. But doesn't the church today know the truth of this parable as well? How many times have we tried new ideas for programs or ministries in hopes that they would reach new people in relevant ways? We try to open our doors wider to the community based on careful readings of demographic studies and surveys. We keep trying to spread the word, but sometimes it seems like no one's listening. And some of our best ideas get really lousy responses. So we too need to remember that in the parable, only one in four seeds take root. Does that mean, therefore, that we ought to be more careful next time? Not according to the parable. God the farmer just throws out more seed, more often, over a broader area. 
God throws it out in the spring and in the winter. And the message here is not to be more cautious. The message here is to throw out more seed and to see what happens. The promise of this parable is that God's harvest happens in God's time. So keep on casting seeds. Keep on showing compassion and living faithfully. Don't stop taking risks for love because we don't know where the soil is fertile or ready for planting. Because most importantly, look how this parable ends. What good soil there was was really, really good. We're talking miracle grow. It says that the grain came forth 30, 60, even 100 fold. Now a sevenfold yield would be a great result for a farmer. That would constitute a wonderful year, a bumper crop. But a hundredfold, that's not normal. This is abundance and generosity and blessing. For when God casts a seed, a miracle can happen. Now, some years ago, Bill Moyers produced a wonderful documentary film on the hymn Amazing Grace. It was a wonderful program that showed the power of that one song of love to plant seeds of hope in the most unexpected places. The last segment in that documentary was filmed at Wembley Stadium in London. And the event was an all-day benefit concert celebrating the dramatic changes that had been occurring in South Africa. Most of the performers were popular rock and rollers like the group Guns N' Roses. But surprisingly though, the promoters of the benefit concert scheduled the opera singer, Jesse Norman, to sing Amazing Grace as the closing act. And the, so the film cuts back and forth between scenes of this massive, unruly crowd in the stadium to Jesse Norman, who was waiting with Bill Moyers in her dressing room. The crowd yells for encores and the group's all obliged while Jesse Norman waits for that time for her to take the stage. Well, finally, despite the screaming and the disorderliness of the crowd, she's called to sing. And Jesse Norman, dressed in African garb, walks out alone. No backup band, just a single spotlight leading her out. The crowd is loud and restless. People yell for more Guns N' Roses, and other people keep chanting. The documentary then, camera spans the unruly crowd. But then all alone, a cappella, Jesse Norman begins to sing very slowly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And then a remarkable thing happened in Wembley Stadium that night. As she sang, 70,000 people became silent. And by the time she began the second verse, she had the crowd in her hands. And with the third verse, his grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Thousands of people were singing with her. And after the concert, Bill Moyers asked her what happened out there, and she confessed that she did not know. But whatever happened, she planted a seed of amazing grace on a field of 70,000 people, and that night, they listened. Let us therefore stand and affirm our faith together. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives.
seated. As we move together in a time of prayer, I would invite you to come and light a candle that might symbolize your prayer. Meet us where we are 
and may we be fertile ground for your love. We are thankful for all that is bright and new, and for the gift of your love. To that end, gracious God, we gather our voices as one in the prayer that Jesus gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, generous God, let us cast our seed out in the form of our resources as the ushers come to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, please.